Uh, what's got the plague, my Robert Evans, host of Behind the Bastards, the sickest man in podcasting? Uh, I have some sort of non-COVID thing. I did take the test, uh, so I have been I've been mainlining. You know, I, I I said I've been sober lately, but now I am a, a Theraflu addict. Uh, I don't even Ooh. mix it into my drinks anymore. I just pour the powder straight out and rail that shit. You know, good for you. That's the good stuff. Um, our guest who just congratulated me on my Theraflu addiction, uh, mm-hmm. Mr. Miles Gray. How are you doing, yes. Miles Gray? I'm great. I'm great. Thank you for having me back. Shout out to the BTB. What's, what do you call it? BTB Nation? Your little bast. Shout out the little bastards. Yeah, yeah, the um, little bastards. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> shout out all my little bastards out there. Shout out all. Shout out all the little bastards out there. Love y'all. Um, mm-hmm. And I'm, yeah, I just, uh, I'm bracing myself for yet a, a, again <sighs> the ups and downs of Man. recording with you. Where I'm like, what? <laughs> and then like crying inside for the rest of the day. You said that it just made me think if we'd gone with my original plan for this podcast and made it all about Saddam Hussein, we could call <laughs> our fan, fans the Husseiniacs. Oh, oh, yeah. See, yeah. I, I I just thought about that now, but that's a good one. Um, yeah, Miles, were you in the room when Robert pitched the show on the phone when he was running through what sounded like a wind tunnel? Were you in the room? I must have been. Yeah, I mean that was so such early days, and like we were all working on all this shit together. But yeah, yeah I feel like yeah, yeah, yeah and yeah, even yeah, yeah. I, I mean I remember all the fucking process of coming up with the a title and the art and all yeah. that shit. Shout out my boy Alan, you know, for the iconic cover art. Yeah, uh-huh. Alan Lee. Uh-huh. Yes. Miles, have you been a good day? You happy? Fuck oh, off, dude. I hate off. just to pose this shit. You in a good yeah, mood? Yeah, I'm having a fucking good day, man. <laughs> all right, I'm just, all right. I'm, my, my little boy has two little teeth coming in. I'm oh, like, wow, wonderful. Look at this. It's and Valentine's I'm like, Sorry. Day. Yeah. We're recording I gotta this. Go, I got to go and get my fucking head kicked in by yeah. whatever tale yeah. of fuckery you're going to. Nothing, nothing guide goes me with a nice, peaceful day like a story of one of the most nightmarishly abusive people I have ever read about Jesus. in my life. Ugh. Uh, <laughs> see, God is punishing me with a sickness for taking such pleasure in in making you unhappy, Miles. Oh yeah. Oh you. Okay. Well, look. I'm as someone who was went to school where they tried to put the fear of God in me, but it didn't work. Uh, you know, I'm I'm, I'm kind of split. I don't know if that. I don't know if I want to talk ill of a man of God, but we'll yeah. have to see. Uh, have you heard of this man of God, a fellow named T. B. Joshua? First of all, no. And mm-hmm. when Sophie hit me up and was like, hey, you know, we might be talking about this or that. And then she's like, OK, actually, Robert, Robert's going to write something on TB Joshua. I didn't Google it uh-huh. because I'm like, what the <laughs> fuck is this? I thought it was like, stupid. like, did he give a bunch of people tuberculosis? <laughs> that would be the fun version of this. Yeah. If he was just like the typhoid Mary of tuberculosis. <laughs> no, exactly. Like, like, like the Johnny like Appleseed of tuberculosis. Yeah. Just right. It's like, oh, who's this TB Joshua? <laughs> oh, that's whole TB Joshua. <laughs> giving everybody TB. <laughs> yeah. He's like, when he coughs, look at his little handkerchief he coughs into and tell me if there's blood. Uh, uh, but yeah, I was like, and then. This morning, out of a morbid curiosity, I'm like, let me just see what the top line description of this person was. And I was like, oh, no, oh, yeah. we oh, got yeah. a pastor in Nigeria. Who, uh-huh. And I don't know what the rest is, but I, <laughs> I know how evangelical things operate over yeah. there and they can be pretty wild. Yeah. And this is one of those like, you know, there's like Africa, for whatever reason, like bastardry over there does not usually go as viral as like the very worst people from like, I don't know, Europe, the United, even like South America, Asia. Um, But like TB Joshua is not just, he's not just a bastard. He was like up until his death very recently, one of probably like the 20 or 30 most influential religious figures alive on the planet, massively influential Pentecostal preacher, millions and not just in Nigeria and not just in West Africa, but all over the world in Southeast right. Asia and Europe, the United millions and millions of followers, huge, huge spoke in I the international Pentecostal community. Very, very important guy. Yeah, I feel like the, the the religious bastards, they're able to fly under the radar a little bit longer than everybody else. Like if you're not yeah. like some dictator, despot kind of despotic leader, you're like it's like yeah. I don't know, like when you get the cover when when you when you're covered in the blood of Christ. Yeah. <laughs> it is one of those just roll off. Yeah, it's this mix of I think they get protected from like members of the same faith some of the, whom like sure. obviously a lot of times the people who do expose them are also members of the same faith. But like that's probably one reason why sometimes it takes well to spread and i think also you get among like atheists or even 
as we'll talk about, Pentecostals are kind of in an extreme sect of evangelical Christianity from like Mm -hmm. more moderate centrist, you know, Christians in like the West. I mean, obviously, the Pentecostal movement is huge in the United States, but even in the United States, I think a lot of like people who are Christians, but you know, they they live in like the East Coast or they live in the West Coast or like just like big cities. They may right. not know how wild some of that shit gets, right? Um, and they may kind of write off stories about these guys as just like, oh, well, that's just you know normal in that chunk of the faith or whatever. And T. B. Joshua was not, to be honest. Like, I have a lot of issues with Pentecostal Christianity, but a lot of the people who were trying to expose him for years were other Pentecostal pastors. Um, oh, but he shit. just got ignored for in, in a lot of what he was doing. Now, a lot of people who enabled him were other Pentecostals. Don't get me wrong. Side note, I feel like, you know, based on all the fuckery that's going on, you could have a like a sister podcast behind the pastors. Behind the pastors? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we could do an I mean, episode every week for the next so 30 many, years. I'm not yeah. joking. Every fucking week, there's some freak somewhere who's like, yeah, this youth pastor is caught with child porn or some other yeah. dark shit. And I'm like, man, we're still we're still acting like these are the people that are above or beyond reproach. But yeah, anyway, behind no. the pastors, look, I'm behind here to the pastors. The yeah. yeah, we could also do a whole pa- uh, podcast series on the Catholic Church, uh, on the Catholic yeah. Church in like the 70s. You know, we, right. even if we just decade stick to decade. one decade, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. we could really. <laughs> so here's the hard facts of this guy's life. Timotope Balagan Joshua was born on June 12, 1963, in a town called Aragidi Akoko in the southwest coastal state of Ondo in Nigeria. Uh, Aragidi Akoko is very poor, um, and it is unlikely that his family had access to any kind of like really meaningful wealth at any point stretching back in recent memory. He is very poor. Everyone around him is very poor. He grows up in like uh, a, a background of pretty desperate poverty. Mm-hmm. Um, now, he does seem to have a fairly strong family, uh, which is good. It gives him a leg up on a lot of people who are like, like don't have that benefit, obviously. Right. But he, th- this is this is a guy who's going to have to to fight for any amount of like wealth uh, that he wants to have. His family are Yoruba. Uh, that is an ethnic group in Southwest Africa that encompasses the largest chunk of Niger Congo language speakers. Like many Yoruba families, TB Joshua grows up. He has both Muslim and Christian relatives in his close family. And one thing people will say about him when he's a, a pastor is that a lot of evangelical pastors in Nigeria are very anti-Muslim, and he was he was not nearly as much as is common. Uh, he's among a not a lot nearly of as much. <laughs> There's <laughs> a as little we'll get bit. into. He's going yeah. to like he's gonna like throw Muslims under the bus at a certain point in his future, but he does have like a lot of uh, Muslims in his family. And so for a while, at least he's a lot better on some of that stuff than a lot of other people, than a lot of other like pastors, Christian pastors in the area. Uh, His father, Kola Wole, was well-educated and made a living translating the Bible. So from a fairly early age, he's both taught that it's important to learn how to read and specifically to to be able to read the Bible. Like this is something that he's going to do obsessively from a very young age. Praise God. Praise God. Yeah. Yeah, he's big on that. Yeah, um, his father Christ. dies when he's young, um, and he is, I think, when he's like 12 or something like that, and he's raised after that by his uncle, who is a Muslim man. Again, he's going to be kind of more tolerant than a lot of people on that sort of situation. Right. Uh, he, he grows up speaking a mix of Yoruba, English, and Pidgin. Um, his English is never going to be considered very good, uh, in part because he doesn't finish secondary school, and he has limited formal education in general. What time he does spend in school is at St. Stephen Anglican, which is a religious primary school. His teachers called him Little Pastor because he was obsessed with the Bible from a young age and preached to his classmates. That's not a red flag. (laughs) That's not a red flag at all. Preaching to your classmates when you're like 10. Kid preachers are the freakiest fucking Mm -hmm. creatures on earth. Oh my God. There's There's like, yeah, yeah, there's like this vibe of like, you're just showing, you're just regurgitating shit the adults are saying around you, but they do it with such passion and conviction. You're like, I don't, I don't know. Maybe you fucking God is talking to you, but please, yeah. you were nine years old. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, you know, take some of this with a grain of salt. I think the stuff about him being called little pastor, I hear often enough and is consistent enough that I believe it. We don't have great sources on his early life. Like they're all say, fan websites and the like. Oh, wait. So like, first of all, your research methodology for this is what? Like, I don't imagine there's like a book on like all the shitty things. I, TV I did, Joshua did read like, a book on him. No, th- now there's good. The best info on this guy's actual crimes comes from the BBC. BBC. So the BBC 
can be a problematic entity in some ways, but they have a division of the BBC called BBC Africa Eye, which reports right. on Africa that does extremely good work. They're some of the only people, for example, reporting on like war crimes by the Cameroonian government. They do really good work and they did a long series on this guy. So there's mm. – and interviewed a lot of people. So there is good reporting on his crimes at this point. Right. There's just not a whole lot that we can absolutely verify about his early life. Right, because it's always yeah. some form of like myth building or yeah. praise or yeah, just bias towards like how great he was. Yeah, the, the anecdotes we get are all shit that his fans pulled out of like speeches he gave during like religious ceremonies, right? Because right. that's like a big thing you're talking about. Like when I was a kid, I did this and this and right. I saw, you know, the spirit of God came into me and whatnot. Um, that's where you get a lot of these details, which is like there's a good doc. If you people want to know the way in which these kind of of pastors massage and just outright invent backstories in order to like make themselves kind of fit in with some of these common evangelical narratives. There's a documentary I always recommend called Marjo. And it's about a guy who started out as a child pastor. His parents had him preaching when he was like four or five years old. He was like doing marriages at like age four or five or some (laughs) shit. And it was all a scam for money, right? He was like, I never believed in God. And my, and his parents abandoned him as soon as he was old enough that it wasn't cute. Right. So you can't make money once he's an adult. There's nothing special about an adult pastor. So they just fucking wow. bounce and he like takes a film crew in. This is in the United States and all these like evangelical revivals in the 70s. It's a really good documentary. Once it won an Oscar. Um, okay. I, I, I recommend it to everybody. Marja, yeah. one of my very favorite movies. Um, also, he grows up to be an actor and is on the A-team. So in an episode. Marjo was? Yeah, he's a bad guy in one episode of the A-team, I think. Yes. Um, a, so there you see, go. Praise Christ. Praise Christ. <laughs> praise Christ. Through him, all things are possible. Things. You, can all things. Yeah. you can start. Yeah. You can be a bad guy on the A-team <laughs> yeah. type cast probably. Was this guy black? You said, was he no, African no, no. He's pastor? a white guy. He's a white guy. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, yeah. look, I'm maybe it wasn't God. It might have just been white supremacy that got you there. I don't want to conflate <laughs> the two, but it was one of the two. <laughs> I'm going to say anytime you get to hang out with B.A. Baracus, that's the hand of God. That's oh, the hand yeah. of God. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Especially if you could, yeah. He'd be like, can I wear one of your chains? He's like, yeah, man. Like, oh, yeah. Praise Christ, baby. So um, the website Who Owns Kenya, which I, I'm not sure about the provenance of, but uh, it, it does seem to have a lot of detail on this guy. They uh, have an article on him titled The Man of God Who Stayed in His Mother's Womb for 15 Months, which gives you an idea of the kind of claims he makes. And again, this is stuff he's <laughs> saying during speeches. He like claims that he was his mom was pregnant with him for 15 months, and so he's a yeah. miracle baby. I yeah. guess when you're that holy, God needs an extra like six months to really make sure you get yeah. finished yeah Yo, you need that you need that wait yeah man you need two just the what is that the fourth and fifth trimester yeah. so he I'm came as on the holy fifth as trimester. 1.8 babies yeah <laughs> roughly i'm not great at math folks don't come here and correct me if that's wrong he better have been walking and talking and shit yeah if he was in there oh, yeah. that long cooking yeah. no he'd better come out knowing how to read god damn yeah. it and um, do my taxes <laughs> yeah so I do find that very funny because I even heard that claim that like, yeah, I took 15 months to be born. What, um, are, what, are, you, what are you stunting on people with yeah, that? Yeah, what, what, is that really a brag thing? Like, Yeah, you're like, you're clingy? <laughs> yeah. Are you All like giving media, shit I mean. to kids who were born early? Oh, you came out after eight months? <laughs> Not nearly as holy as me, baby. I'm a 15 monther. Yeah, my mom tried to get rid of me. I said, no, I'm doing some Bible study in here. I'm not ready yet. To confront On the weekends, he goes thing. to just just goes to like Nick U wards and makes fun of the babies. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha, look at you. Look at you. Couldn't be me. Couldn't be me. I came out. I came out 26 pounds. Yeah, I almost didn't come out at all. I was going to yeah. stay in there. <laughs> I, except I would have physically killed my mother if I stayed in there and kept growing. It would have been bad. The parasitic baby. Oh, that's funny. So later in life, he would also claim that as a child, he became aware that his coming had been foretold in prophecy for more than 100 years. I've never found what this prophecy is supposed to be. <laughs> Maybe yeah. someone was like, yeah, there's going to be a huge fucking baby someday. Is that in the book of Revelations? <laughs> and that boy was me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, okay. So. Anyway, this bulletproof source cites statements from Joshua that as a child, he would read the entire Bible every two months. Quote, every two months, I would have read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. It was the only subject that interested me in primary school. In exams, I scored 99% consistently, whereas I performed woefully in other subjects. My excelling in Bible knowledge affected the other subjects where I performed poorly. So basically, he was so good at the Bible that his brain just didn't work for anything else. Yeah, Um, I can't I can't do I can't even do one plus two. Yeah, yeah. I'm so I'm so Christed up up here. 
Now, what I do disbelieve is a claim that he made that one day whilst at school, a madman entered his class carrying a weapon. The type is not specified. Quote, everyone ran away, but he managed to calm the madman down through prayer. From that day onwards, he knew there was something special in him. Oh, wait, how I'm going to need more details. Yeah. How old is he? <laughs> I think when he, this is like when he's in like, uh, like middle school, maybe. And a man came through with a weapon. Just a unquote, weapon. Weapon. Just a weapon. Okay. Okay. And he prays. He prays him out of hurting anybody. Um, <laughs> I'm. I'm guessing. I mean, it's West Africa. Maybe it's a cutlass. You know, so it's a. It's a machete. Maybe. Yeah. But I mean, yeah. machetes are very certainly very accessible. But who knows? My 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 actual guess is that this did not happen. <laughs> right. 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 Now, yeah. He's acting like he's Kevin Spacey in the Negotiator. He's Chris <laughs> yeah, Sabian or some he talks shit. Talks him out I of got this. I got, Let me pray with so, him. So. Shortly before starting secondary school, his father died. Uh, And again, he's raised by his uncle. He drops out of school pretty soon after this, I think because he has to get a job to help take care of the family. And he spends years working a series of odd gigs, like a lot of people who come from his level of like wealth and stuff in Nigeria, in that part of Nigeria. One of his jobs is a poultry attendant, uh, which mostly consisted of scrubbing chicken shit with his hands and putting it in bags to be turned into fertilizer. Um, My my new Hmm. favorite Kenyan news and culture your website says this job was so demeaning that no Nigerian did it. It was mainly done by Ghanaians. Um, wow, shots fired at Ghana, your neighbor's <laughs> next door. There's all in these articles, there's a lot of shots fired at Ghana, Miles. It's wild. I've been to Ghana, and uh-huh. the there there is like this sort of back and forth where they'll be talking, they talk, they like just chat shit about each other, like Nigerians. Mm-mm, I don't know, I don't know about I, them. I, it, this happens everywhere. It's all regional. Like, it's yeah, like, exactly. It, your neighbor, you're always Texas like, and Oklahoma shit, right? Like yeah. Nigeria and Ghana. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. So at some point in his early 20s, he experienced a three-day trance in which God visited him and told him, I am your God. I am giving you a divine commission to go and carry the work of the Heavenly Father. This is the inciting incident of the TB Joshua story. In the interest of trying to put together a more complete picture of the man, I opted to read a propaganda by what I thought was a propaganda biography by one of his followers. Its title is Rejoice and See What Happens Next, The Life and Times of TB Joshua. Okay. Now, this book does not give us the life and times of TV Joshua. It's basically a big brochure for like going to visit his church, and we will talk about why. Uh, a little later that he wanted people doing that. Just marketing. It was just marketing material. It's, it's all marketing. You get very little on the guy's life. It is kind of interesting to note that the uh, the preface of this book opens by saying, T.B. Joshua has shown every indication of following this anointed path. He is worthy of careful study and emulation. And then complaining, T.B. Joshua has been made out to be controversial and has become the subject of persecution, especially by fellow religious leaders. This is puzzling to me. I have been in his presence, and I can say that he is disarmingly humble, gentle, and a generous man. <laughs> So that's good. Glad glad we're opening with like a real unbiased account of this. Oh fella. yeah, he's so humble. Yeah, well, he sounds great so far. He sounds like he's you know he was humble cooking man. for fifteen months. <laughs> Got a book he talked published down, about his miracles. Yeah, yeah, he talked <laughs> down a man with a machete or who uh-huh. knows could have been a bazooka. Any kind of know. weapon. We have yeah. no idea. Yeah, he just had uh, enriched plutonium maybe yeah. in his hand. <laughs> who knows? But it, yeah. he he stopped it. Okay, mm-hmm. I, look, this doesn't this. Get to the bastard. I don't even know. This, this guy sounds cool, Robert. Yeah, I'm not yeah. Lie. So, so far, he's great. Um, yeah, praise Christ. Yeah. So he's uh, he, he starts preaching. Um, at some point, he's probably in his like early to mid 20s when he starts preaching. And this seems to have been a fairly like humble start. There's some grainy footage that exists, apparently. I've heard it reported on. I haven't seen it. That shows him in a, somewhere. It started out with something like a dozen, maybe 20 followers under a bamboo marquee in the early 1980s. Um, so he starts out small, but his, his flock grows fairly rapidly. And the mid 1980s is a pretty terrible time for most things, uh, except for cocaine and being a Pentecostal preacher in Nigeria. (laughs) Um, and especially for the latter, it's basically the best time ever. And this merits a little bit of explanation. Um, first off on Pentecostalism, if you've ever seen a video, if you're wondering like, what the fuck is he talking about when he says Pentecostals? Cause I do think a lot of like, even a lot of people who are Christian, right. But who are like a fairly mainstream, like kind you're of right. Christianity and like yeah. normal, you know, believe in evolution, live a normal modern life. They just like, you know, they're, they're Christian, whatever may not know much about this. It's, it's something you really encounter a lot, particularly if you grow up in kind of the deep South and rural areas, it's, it's, it's gotten more common, obviously as, as we've yeah. gotten older. 
If you've ever seen videos of like some wild seeming Christian religious ceremony where people are are chanting in tongues and or screaming, flopping around on the floor, looking like they're seizuring, that's a Pentecostal service, almost certainly. There are some some other denominations where you'll get stuff like that. Um, yeah. In popular culture, they're often called snake handlers. Yeah. Um, this is because a lot of Pentecostals used to pass around venomous snakes. And basically the idea is if you get bitten like it means that you weren't faithful enough. Um, right. And also if you get bitten and die, it means that God just wanted you to die. Yeah, now, that was his plan. <laughs> that was his plan for you. A lot of times they're using non-venomous snakes and it's like, it's a show, right? Right. Um, and a lot of times they'll like defang the snakes, uh, especially for like the pastor, because the pastor you want to like- <laughs> Could you imagine- yeah. <laughs> It's like, look, the snake snake bit me, but I don't have any wound on my hand, only through Jesus. Yeah. Where's that? Wait, I didn't give you the stunt snake, Pastor. Mm -hmm. Oh, fuck. (laughs) Oh, fuck. Okay. There's Uh, definitely motherfuckers who died from that. Like, oh yeah, yeah. There has to be. I mean, I feel like there's there were headlines about like some snake handling preacher who, you know, somehow who who'd have thought his handling of a. The copperhead ended with his demise. <laughs> yeah. It was also common. You still find this sometimes, but like people would drink strychnine during these ceremonies. And again, uh-huh. it's like, a you know, if you have faith, you'll know God won't kill you unless it's your time. Yeah. Now, Pentecostals are not the only Christian sect to do snake handling. It actually probably started. I think the first snake handlers on the Christian historic record are the second century Ophites, which is a Gnostic sect. I do not know much about them, but Mm. I came across that when I was looking up snake handlers. So that's neat. (laughs) <laughs> Pentecostalism has its origins in the 1800s with radical evangelical movements that focused on faith healing and the imminently coming end times. One description you'll hear a lot is that regular Christians kind of, st- as modernity comes in, they stop believing in miracles, or at least not miracles as a thing that like people can can incite, you know, through their direct faith, mm-hmm. you know, but as a thing, you know, maybe it's a thing that happens sometimes, but you're not, you can't make miracles by like praying for God and stuff, right? That's not a thing I think a lot Lot, most people believe, but Pentecostals do. And this obsession with miraculous happenings is a hallmark of that kind of worship. Pentecostal churches started to spread in Nigeria around the turn of the 1900s. Um, it was really given a shot in the arm by the influenza epidemic. A lot of early Nigerian Pentecostal preachers engaged in faith healing of influenza victims. They started out as kind of an Anglican offshoot, because obviously the Anglican church is British and the British you know, mm-hmm. owned them in Nigeria for yeah. much longer than, than they should have. Yeah. yeah, and a Ghana, yes, and a Ghana. And yeah, uh, the breaks kind of between the Anglicans and the Pentecostals became more defined in the 20s. Um, and they started, like Nigerian Pentecostals started to affiliate with US-based churches more, like the Faith Tabernacle in Philadelphia. One characteristic of this particular segment of Christianity is a near constant conflict with medical science. Um, I'm not going to say that's every group of Pentecostals, but it's very common to find Pentecostals who preach against like certain, at least certain kinds of modern medicine. You know, right. faith is supposed to handle it. It's not like an across the board thing like it is with anything like Jehovah's Witnesses, but it's not uncommon. And early Nigerian Pentecostals were extreme, even to their British cousins in their rejection of modern medicine. A lot of this is tied into colonialism. I think a lot of it also has to do with the difficulty of obtaining good medical care in a lot of the areas where this is spreading. Um, A study in Pew Research notes, originating in evangelical student revivals, a wave of Pentecostal expansion spawns new churches in the 60s and 70s. The leader of this expansion is Benson Idahoza, one of Africa's most influential Pentecostal preachers. Idahoza establishes the Church of God Mission International in 1972. In 1974, the Pentecostal umbrella organization Grace of God Ministry is founded in eastern Nigeria. The Deeper Life Bible Church founded in 1975 and soon becomes one of Nigeria's largest neo-Pentecostal churches with an estimated 350,000 members by 1993. So this is a pretty rapid expansion and these are very big churches. I mean, it's yeah, it's all lining up for that. Man, the faith here yeah. part is just, it, it, yeah, yeah. It, it's like, I mean, because there's already, you know, this culturally, there's a lot of thinking that sort of goes beyond the bounds of like science, right? So to even to, for these, you know, these very opportunistic sort of faith healers to to really get in on that, be like, no, man, yeah. like, just just fucking believe, baby. Mm-hmm. That's all. Yeah. 
Yeah, and that's uh, that's where T.B. Joshua is going to stitch in. Um, so T.B. Joshua's church, which also began in 1986, was called Synagogue Church of All Nations, or SCONE. And I think the synagogue, this is very common. I made a comment once that like, Christians reincorporate some some groups of like particularly fundamental Christians like to reincorporate bits of Jewish religious tradition like mm. you know, the use of shofars reincorporate was the wrong term people got rightfully frustrated they this is cultural appropriation right right, right, right. like yeah like that that's what that's what's going on right. um and and I I'm guessing I I because I don't I've I have never heard of synagogue used outside of the tradition of the Jewish faith. Um so my I mean, guess yeah, is that just that's, shorthand that's what this for me, is. Yeah. that's what that would imply. Yes. At ten times out of ten yeah. in my mind. Yeah. So that that's that's what I'm guessing they're doing here. Um so people will call it scone, and that's what we will usually call it because synagogue church of all nations is a bit of a mouthful. Yeah. Um and in fairly short order throughout the mid like mid to late nineteen eighties, scone goes from dozens to hundreds to hundreds of thousands of regular attendance. Uh, it becomes common for there to be more than 15,000 people attending, attending services at once in a single day. Obviously, this necessitates the building of a massive, like, stadium-sized church. You know, these are huge events every time. Right. And he's out there every day, basically. He or some of his disciples. A lot of the p- appeal of these neo-Pentecostal churches in Nigeria is the ability of worshipers to witness and participate in miracles, right? Not just that miracles are happening, but that your pastor is able to down. call down miracles and you get to be right there and watch this shit, you know? That's some of this, ticket. there's some like kayfabe here. Some of this is like what people get out of wrestling, you know? Right, right, for real. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And it's it's not coincidental that the massive expansion of these churches that are all doing these very big, and we'll talk about how these look, these big like miracle shows, coincides with a huge expansion in the availability of televisions for working class Nigerians, right? That has hit like, it, it hit saturation by the 80s. Mm-hmm. And so these preachers, uh, and not only that, but it also becomes a lot easier to make your own TV and get it on the air, right? So all of those things kind of have to happen, and that takes a period of time. But by the 80s, all of those things are possible. And so any of these preachers with big congregations have access to enough capital to purchase cameras and airtime, which they use to air slick videos of different ill people being miraculously healed. And Miles, you know what will miraculously heal our listeners? I I hope it's some kind of product. Yes, yes. The only guarantee we make on this podcast is that if you are sick, buy someone something that advertises on our our show and you will be healed of anything. Just rub it on your head. Yeah, yeah. You cannot die if you purchase the products that advertise on our show. Unless that was God's plan. Unless that was God's plan. Obviously, obviously. Obviously. Ridiculous, ridiculous ad transition, both of you. We're back, and we're thinking about how unless unless that's God's plan, really, really gives you a lot of leeway. You can get away with anything with those words. Yeah, but people, I just, you know, if it's really funny, please, please send us what, what, what ad pops up, please. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's really funny, please. That's a good like parenting tip. Can we go to the playground, Daddy? If it's God's plan, you know. If it's, if it's God's, God's plan, plan, let's see if it's. Yeah. I mean, but that yeah. is the kind of shit like super religious parents will say, yes, like yes, just yes. to like avoid the responsibility. They're like, I don't know. I mean, maybe you didn't. Maybe I forgot your birthday because that was God's plan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And Sorry. you do. It is like uh, it's used very differently, but like it's used a lot in the uh, in the Muslim world as like uh, if you're like, hey, do you think you know we'll be able to do this or this will happen? Like you know, inshallah, right? Which yeah. means like probably not. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm not looking good. God I mean, but you know, it's the same thing. People say that too. They're like, yeah, man, Lord yeah. willing, you yeah. know, but God I don't willing, know. we'll right? see. We'll see what happens. Miles, um, I'll never forget your birthday. Thank you. Thank you. Never. Yeah. Thank you, no. Robert. I just, I just not, never. You don't have the same privilege as Miles. Sorry. Wow. Yeah. I don't remember my own birthday. Not after all this theraflu I've been dropping. <laughs> I don't even know my name. Let me let me do a fat line of the uh, of the peach flavor. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's like, the why good does he, stuff. 
Hey, what's he snorting out of that bullet? Dude, it's Theraflu. It's kind of Theraflu fucking weird. brown round bullet yeah. bullet powder and Theraflu. <laughs> it opens the capillaries, gets the NSA IDs into your system faster. Straight in, straight in. Wow. Straight to the vein, baby. Yeah. <laughs> just just like cooking flare Theraflu on a spoon. Oh shit. You're like, hey, hand me that dialysis tubing really quick. I gotta tie off. What? <laughs> That's Cops how you come use in. it. Yeah, we couldn't arrest him. There's no law against ejecting Theraflu yeah, in a parking disgusting. lot. Disgusting. <laughs> just, I don't know. There's no law against just freaking people the fuck out. Yeah, it's fucked up. <laughs> uh, so. Spectacle was always part of the deal at Scone. Healing the blind is like easy shit, right? You can have someone pretend that they're blind, right? And then they can see, you know, super easy. But that doesn't look exciting, right? What looks exciting, he would love to have like parades of people who were missing limbs, like roll in on wheel boards and stuff to get like the healing touch and claim like their pain went away or something. He would love to have people who had like, he like skin lesions and stuff come in and then they all fall off. Right. And this kind of shit, like these are, these are staged, right? Like they're using yeah. makeup. They're doing all this kind of shit, but his, it works. His flock goes from dozens to hundreds to tens of thousands over the course of like the eighties to the nineties. Like it gets massive. He, there are two he was in, wiping off people's skin conditions. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, that's a big one. That's a big, and there's <laughs> there's too many stories of this time to count. So I'm going to focus on one really well documented recent case, okay. and I'm focusing on this because this is someone who got arrested by the Nigerian government for miracle fraud recently. But it gives you an idea of how this industry has always worked. Miracle? Um, wait, is that a law we have on our oh, books? Yeah. Oh no, we don't have that shit. You can, you could. That's Nigeria is so far ahead of us in pr- punishing know. miracle. And that fraud. way, they're like, no, you guys don't understand. These people are gonna fucking bring down our entire society. Like if we don't get that shit under control. Yeah. God damn. Because who's the guy who sells those fucking buckets? Those end time yeah. buckets? Oh yeah. Uh, fucking. Um, we did episodes on him, uh, but I'm spacing on his name right now. It is. But- what the fuck. But yeah, the um one of the through lines in the story, obviously, he gets away with a lot because of corruption in the Nigerian government because of bribing people. But there's mm-hmm. also like the Nigerian government has like passed laws and shit that I wish we had in the US to try to limit some <laughs> right. of this stuff. We're talking um, about Jim Baker, aren't we? Jim, Jim Baker, Baker, yeah. Baker okay. I there was bo- there I'm like, go. we did we did several yeah. episodes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, like, Those buckets though, they look like I, absolute shit. Like yes. I have I have to say the Nigerian government fails in a lot of ways the u.s government has also failed to contain this stuff but they have also right. attempted to limit it in more ways than we have so yeah. I, i'll give them some credit could um, you imagine if someone tried to put forward like a bill for miracle fraud in Congress? oh no they would get shot they would get literally oh, yeah. get fucking shot like somehow yeah. like that's the fucking line oh They're god like, that would piss mother- people off so much miracle fraud? um so i i'm gonna i want to detail the story of one specific miracle fraudster 44 year old Mrs. Bo's Olasukanmi, I think is is how that's pronounced. Um, she was arrested by the Nigerian government in 2020 for being a fake miracle actor who would sell her services to different pastors, right? Basically, she was really good. She was able to dislocate her arm in an unconventional way that made it look like it was shattered and in pieces. Like there was at least I saw there's like one picture of it out there. Like it's, it's pretty good at it. This is a legit yeah. skill. And I'm going to quote from a write up in the Nigerian Guardian here. Once she enters the stage, she would pretend that the broken right arm had been hanging and all medical efforts to heal her in both Orthodox and native hospitals proved abortive until one of her friends, who was a member of the church, advised her to try the church. At this point, one of the ministering pastor or the general overseer would step forward and demonstrate as if the Holy Spirit had entered him. After speaking in tongues for some minutes, he would order the woman to come very close to him while the congregation would be silent, anxiously waiting to see the broken right arm that has been hanging. The pastor would ask the woman, do you want to be healed? Have you been born again? If she answers in the negative then he led her to christ in prayer he would then order the evil spirit that bent her arm to depart and be destroyed by fire as he is ordering the evil spirit to depart the hanging broken arm will be coming back gradually to its form until it is completely stretched down and normal and then he would ask the congregation to praise the lord while the congregation is busy praising god one of the church members whose role is to take the woman away would appear and whisk her away and then she gets paid wow and so what she's just like the meryl streep of fucking Miracle there's, fraud. There's acting. a bunch. You know how 
there's a there used to be like a circuit of people who would do the Jerry Springer style talk shows because they right. had something like marketable, you know, in a weird thing about them. Like, I think it's like that. Right. Yeah. Um, They're like, oh, did you get the arm lady? It's like, no, mm-hmm. I got the dude with the buggy eyes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We're gonna, what are you going to do? What are you, how are you going to explain that? I'm like, it's because his blood pressure is so high. His eyes are bulging. And then yeah, I'm there's too like, many demons back. in his blood. They pop the pressure right up. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Now, this is one woman, but like she gets arrested because the Nigerian police have like units dedicated to busting miracle crimes, which is I, I do want to see that TV show. I want to see oh, yeah. like a law and order miracle cra- yeah. fraudsters dude, unit. It would give people the wrong idea. Like, dude, uh, law and order MCU. Yeah. It's like, yeah. no, not Marvel Let's, asshole miracle <laughs> crimes unit. Yeah. They don't they don't own those letters. So yeah, um, exactly. Joshua and other pastors like him would not just like have these people over and do these miracle shows, but they would make videos of them. And Joshua is really going to be like the number one pastor for pioneering making videos out of this stuff and distributing them around the world. The basic way this works is that, you know, within kind of Nigeria, if you have these people being healed in your shows, it will convince people who are really injured or sick that they or their loved ones might get healed, right? Obviously. But Joshua took this tactic several steps further, right? From an early date, he starts filming videos of these healings, picking the most sensational and impressive and putting them in videos not meant for Nigerian domestic consumption. But these were sent over to Europe, to Great Britain, and to the United States with white missionaries returning from Nigeria. For decades, Nigeria has been a hot destination for missionary tourists, young Christians and professional missionaries traveling to minister to the poor in a relatively friendly climate. Joshua was not the only person to see this as a profitable endeavor, but his matter of fishing for them was unique at the time, sending out propaganda to evangelize British Christians in particular. The BBC documentary that I I cited earlier includes interviews with several young British and South African Caucasian women who were enraptured with and then terribly abused by TB Joshua. Their journeys all start the same way. Members of their local religious communities came back from Nigeria with VHS tapes of miraculous healings. To give you an idea of what some of these healings were and how they looked, I want to return to that book, Rejoice and See What Happens Next, which is centered around numerous case studies, ranging from poor people getting good paying jobs. And I think that shit is meant mainly to like evangelize them to locals, right? Like this is right. a thing that can improve your financial situation to shit like this, which is very much geared towards Europeans that they're trying to get to to come over and join the church. Right. Jude Orakas showed up at the scone with a life-threatening disease. The case, which I originally viewed live, has now been archived by Emmanuel TV, that's his TV channel, and includes a commentary. The story opens with the camera zooming in from a full-body shot then to a medium shot of a man sitting in a chair. He is separated from others, his body quivering in the sunshine and wearing nothing but a pair of shorts. A close-up shot reveals horrendous skin damage. Narrator, a shocking condition brought this man to the synagogue church of all nations, his body riddled with sickness. Right from the crown of his head, his entire body has been engulfed in a plague, shattering his skin into scale-like fragments. There is not a hair left on his head as the frightening sickness has completely destroyed his skin. From his head, the disease rages across his body, damaging every inch and rendering his arms useless. The skin flakes and peels horribly all the way down his arms to his fingers. Not one inch of his skin has been left unaffected. Jude's sister. Man of God, help my brother. He has skin disease for the past six years. We have taken him all over. There is no solution. Neither the herbalists' homes or hospitals have provided any solution. Joshua talks to him briefly, and when he sees Araka is too sick to even talk, he asks him if he can accept Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior, which the man is able to answer. In the name of Jesus Christ, I command that infirmity out. Begin to vomit it out. T.B. Joshua watches the man intently for about 15 seconds, then he speaks again. I say to you, disease, you can hear me. Come out of this man's life. In the name of Jesus, come out. Out! T.B. Joshua. The man begins to shake uncontrollably and bends forward to throw something white and foamy up. You can see what the name of Jesus can do. Out, I say. Out in the name of Jesus. So, gives you an idea, right? Dude. Mm -hmm. This... (laughs) Yeah, okay. It's wild. The... Foaming at the mouth, he's like, "Yo, dude, don't put this Alka Seltzer in." Until yeah, I, it's I say, definitely oh, it's right, gotta boy. be Alka Seltzer. No, that's the oldest trick in the fucking yeah. book. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's good shit. And again, when we're talking about his appeal, obviously as a preacher, he appeals 
uh, to Nigerians as a preacher, but to a lot of these like Europeans, these British people, you know, he's not speaking their language fluently. The appeal right. is not the specifics of what he's saying. It's that he is promising them that if they come to see him, they will get a direct physical connection to a miracle, right? And if you are one of these evangelicals from a wealthy country, like you're going to, you know, you wa- reading the Bible, you're watching Veggie Tales or whatever, um, but you're living like these, this, what you would probably consider compared to these videos, a fairly boring, safe life. And then you see this man physically fighting demons, right? Yeah. And you're like, <laughs> right, right. Well, of course I want to be a part of this. This sounds yeah. so much more exciting than like right. going to church and doing like fucking youth group shit, right? It, it reminds me of like 90s <laughs> skate culture where like you would be like, oh, you get the new toy machine tape mm-hmm. and you're like, yo, I'll bring it over. And you're like, oh, dude, let me see the bail scenes or whatever. And like, there was always this culture being like, yo, check this tape out. I got this tape. Except in this version. I also, I mean, it's clever that he's also using the way the Western world views Africa in this like yes. exotic, yes. mystical way and weaponizing it to be like watch this shit because they are they're already on some bullshit thinking that this is some fucking magic shit is happening here it's like no i'm just a next level scammer that was in Mm -hmm. the womb for 15 months yeah that 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 time really let him prep um yeah but no you have anticipated something we'll get to he deals with this very directly he is very consciously taking advantage of the way westerners look at africa right Right. so i do want to i want to give you an idea of what it looks like when he's because he's these are not just He's not just doing healings, he's doing exorcisms. And these take the place of like Gandalf Saruman magic fights. Like at the most extreme level, he'll like walk in and they're like people will lunge at him and he'll like put his hand out force? and use the name of G and they'll go flying backwards. Like oh. it's so, it's it's pretty cool actually. Right. It looks like, um, like kung fu film, like yeah. wire stunts. They're like, yeah. that's kind of high production. You, you, you know actually what it looks a little bit like if you've watched the fake Steven Seagal Aikido videos or like the Vladimir Putin fake Aikido videos where they're just like touching guys and flinging them through the air. Or like Russian Sistema videos. Exactly. (laughs) It's like, I'm going to tap your fucking, your uh shoulder blade. You're like, ah, (laughs) yeah. God, it's so funny. I want to play you a video of this miles. Look at Okay. Oh shit. L'autorité du nom de Jésus est libérée. L'homme de Dieu l'a appelé à donner l'ordre à cet esprit de partir. De le regard dans les yeux, il a donné l'ordre et le démon est sorti. Now he got this shorty by the dome piece. Python. Watch the screen. He's, he's on the Why ground you? rolling like a python. His boss. His boss. His boss. Yeah. Who's boss? I am the boss of the boss. The boss of the boss. So. Yeah. That's... Pretty, that's like wrestling grade, you oh, know? Oh, hell yeah. That's yeah. fucking school play level uh-huh. fight scene. Of course. Of yeah. course a bunch of like fucking sheltered like teenage evangelical kids are seeing this and they're like, well, I want to go fight demons in Africa. Oh my God. Did you see that? He just like used, used a closed fist, swiped in front of his chest and blew the guy down. Yeah. With the power fucking, of Christ. It's so fun. Oh, I mean, a lot of people fuck. get horribly abused. It's actually not. But this part uh, of it is fun. Yeah. Um, look, you got to <laughs> enjoy part, these right. little moments, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's um, the journey. Now, I, I want to note here again, I don't want to fall into the thing of being like, wow, look at this African preacher and all these people believe this shit like this goes down in the U.S. all the fucking time. No shit. <laughs> Members yeah. of Congress go to churches that are not all that different from this. Right. OK, like, yeah. you know, people who this are is like, not a Nigerian thing. This is a no, thing. <laughs> this is just that. That's what religion gives you. I mean, we've got a whole yeah. bunch of people that are working in the government. that are like mm-hmm. circle jerking for the yeah. end times. Like this isn't like mainstream religious stuff necessarily, but it's not like why wildly uncommon evangelical no, like Pentecostal not at all. Shit, I mean like right? especially yeah. when you see people prophesying you know yeah. or speaking in tongues and shit you're like oh yeah. boy yeah. this is this is a, a derivation on a theme right, right. Um, and I, I think it's also probably my guess would be this is pretty close to what used to be a lot more common back in the day right like when you hear about these stories of like demons and exorcisms and shit and like right. you know someone someone in the town water supply like someone will get like some fucking air got poisoning and everyone will hallucinate and you'll have like a big demon fight in some medieval french village right. i'm sure like there's versions of that to explain it like these kind of there have always been people who have known that like well if you really want to make some money in the religion business you got to put on a fucking show yeah and nothing's like, a better show than fighting demons yeah you got a pyrotechnics guy yeah, exactly. Yeah, I got, got one, dude. You got a I'll fucking, fucking snap fireworks, my dude. fingers. I'll say Satan, demon, get out with the yeah. fires of hell. 
fucking yeah. full plume of fucking flame shoots mm-hmm. up his back, dude. It's sick. Mm-hmm. That anyway, he's like five hundred dollars a gig. It's pretty <laughs> affordable. It's it's cool. It, it's good stuff. So again, I, I, what I want to note is that like while what he is doing is not unique to him, he is maybe the best I've seen at it. He's good. Like these are these are well orchestrated shows. Well, yeah, it's also um, the Riz, bro. Yeah, uh-huh. he's got yeah. it. Yeah, you know, what I mean, yeah. he seems like so cool. He's like, watch me hold this mic with my vest mm-hmm. on. I don't give mm-hmm. a fuck that this dude's mm-hmm. a python. Watch this yeah. shit. Yeah, like he's it feels. <laughs> Like Superman-ish kind of thing. I was like, damn, he's super cocky about it. Like, yeah, okay, some like Superman, that. some Vince McMahon. Like, you got, <laughs> yeah. you, got, you got some of that going in there. Yeah. Um, now, you can see in some of his videos from the aughts that he's very deliberately taken framing techniques from Western reality television. And I'm going to play you a segment from a different scone video about a secret demonic infiltrator, Mr. Any, being caught by one of T.B. Joshua's disciples. And it, it just feels like something I would have seen on MTV in, like, 2001. Here is Mr. Any, pretending to be a Christian, but is a wolf in sheep's clothing. What is his mission here among the people of God? Can darkness be in the midst of light? No. Capital no. Look at Mr. (laughs) Any praying. Capital no. Who is he praying to? There is prayer, (laughs) and there are prayers. And it's like highlighting him in like the crowd shot every time. Like it's like surveillance footage. Yeah. It's or so like some funny. shitty, like back when hard copy mm-hmm. was a show. Like, yeah. Like hard copy is a better. Ass. Yeah. 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 60 minutes hard copy. Yeah. That's a better, that's a better than a current video. affair yeah. for my old heads. Yeah. And the rest of the video proceeds. It's like this big choreographed exorcism. Cause obviously he's like a secret devil infiltrator in, in scone. Um, all that of this goes a over plus writing though. It's great. It's great. It's great shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's really good. <laughs> like, it's like you have a Marvel movie fucking unfolding yeah. at your church service. Like, yeah. dude, last week, a fuck three dudes came out of a fucking portal <laughs> yeah, and of fucked up this infiltrator. <laughs> and then TB Joshua yeah. turned this woman's droopy leg into a muscular yeah. one. Yeah. It was wild, man. You had to be yeah. there. You had to be there. So what happened at your church this Sunday? Ah, a priest told us we shouldn't have sex before marriage. Oh, yeah? Oh. Guy turned into a snake at my church. No. <laughs> no. Like, yeah. And then he yeah. fucking punched him in the head and a flame yeah. came out of his asshole. <laughs> of, of course I'm going to the snake <gasps> church. Yeah. Fuck that all. That dude, I can barely better. stay awake at my fucking <laughs> church, man. <laughs> Now, this all goes over really well with these young white evangelicals from Western countries who are just not used to services being this exciting. You will hear comments from a yeah, no seasoning. seasoning. You'll hear comments from a number of them that are like, I felt like this was where real biblical Christianity was still going down. Right. And I wanted to be a part of it, you know? I cannot exaggerate the extent to which a lot of this was a conscious attempt by T B Joshua to recruit white people. Um, and I'm gonna play a clip from a BBC documentary on T B Joshua called disciples the guy talking here is his former right hand man who helped him start the church he had special interest in the Oyibo Oyibo the whites are you are you surprised that God is using a black man to do all these things sorry I'm sorry I'm not surprised that God is using a black man never ever have I seen what are these motherfuckers wearing (laughs) yeah (laughs) <laughs> wow. 1996, one of the immediate pastors came from South Africa. When they were leaving, he gave more than 200 VHS videos to take home to give to people. Videos of miracles, videos of confessions, video, videos that will fill their head. Wow. I said, this is so expensive. He laughed. You think I'm a fool? I know what I'm doing. A time will come. This synagogue church is going to shoot out from South Africa to the whole world. Now, this guy also will claim that TB Joshua basically said to him, what I am doing by recruiting these people, I want to take advantage of them. I want to get revenge for what white people have done to us, which is, I think is part, I think is largely him because as a spoiler, this guy is not some sort of like anti-colonial hero, most of the people he abuses are black African women, right? Mm. Like he is right. not not at all a, an actually like a hero. But I think he understood that this guy who worked with him might respond to that. Right. Like that that's that's how I read it, right? Right, right, right. Um yeah. Oh, yeah, we taking them we taking from them because for yes, years they've been taking yes. from me. 
Yes. And, and the BBC documentary does a very, very good job of obviously a lot of the victims at sites are uh, white people from South Africa, from England. But most of the victims that I see are black, Nigerian, Ghanaian women, you know, mm. which which is I, I'm glad like they, they clearly put in an effort to not just be like, look at what this guy's doing to white women, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, right, right. But rather to it's, highlight the differences between how he approached like. Which would have been the way uh, people first yeah. would have had outrage like he yes. thought he could get one over on us, the white yeah. People? Yeah. No, no, no. Um, yeah. And it's interesting. There's also there's a lot of very interesting racial dimensions here. You saw in that video, the guy he asks, like, are you surprised to see a black man, you know, preaching the word of God that like, I think that's a South African pastor. Did you see what he was wearing that dress? Oh, yeah. Um, very traditional. That is, yeah, traditional African dress. And I think what is happening here is that these kind of established South African and Western white pastors were being faded by TB Joshua. He was giving them basically like, you can have an authentic African experience, right? Like right. I'm going to give that to you if you endorse me as legitimate. Um, I can't have any other explanation for the way that man is portraying himself. I think like, that there's also, I mean, I saw this when I was in Ghana, like there is like this Canadian expat that lived in this village that like nearby where I was visiting and he kind of became like the elder, like the chief of the village only because like he like was married to a Ghanaian woman, but like built like a property there. And like he dressed like that, like he had the whole vibe, like he was like, no, I'm here to do the African thing. All so right. I wonder if like on some, some level they like, they just really loved the LARP of it all, you know, too, or they're like, yeah. oh, look at me, bro. I look like a goddamn fucking God from West <laughs> Africa right now. Yeah, I some of this is maybe beyond like my my pay grade, but that was my read there in that right. particular scene that like that's kind of what he's offering some of these established white pastors is I that mean, kind of legitimacy. I'm sure and I'm sure that's a very attractive proposition for someone who probably finds himself very self-important like a pastor yes. and then like watch me enter all of these spaces and I'm yeah. accepted with open arms, like no fucking friction at all. Like yeah, yeah. I mean, this TB Joshua is uh yeah, yeah, man. Fucking Machiavelli yeah. over here. It, it, to kind of highlight the experience that he's, he is offering to a lot of these white visitors, I want to play you another clip. Believe you me, brothers and sisters, Nigeria was the last place on earth that I ever wanted to come to. They brought okay. they money launderers, they drug peddlers. And I say, God, sorry. Yeah, he's a piece of heaven on earth. The greatest in the Pompt Nagop Church was when the foreigners started coming. This was strategic and it was planned. I just got a confession to make that I want the whole world to know. In the past, I've always hate blacks. I really hated them. When I got back over here, I saw the love that we received from black people. He used the white people to market his oh, brand. This goofy dude is <laughs> dancing so Having white so well. man or white woman around is like you have achieved. He just say, "Look at these people. <laughs> they don't know where they are." <laughs> the, the white people dancing video there. It's like there's some there's some good, good like 80s dudes shuffling about. <laughs> yeah. Doing some kind of footloose <laughs> some, shit. Some kind of footloose shit. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck is going on? Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, geez, I mean, like, it's interesting, you know, like there are these people who become predatory like this. It's because they yeah. understand the predation that exists around them at many yes. different levels. Yes. And he's just able to like, he has such a mastery of it that he's like, no, watch this. And then I can use white people to legitimize it. He's like, I, I already know how this works. I already know mm -hmm. how this works. I've seen it. I've seen this shit a hundred times. You know, when I know how it works, Miles, mm. sponsoring a podcast. Mm-hmm. And we're back. I just want to say that product. Thank fuck for that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Did that save yeah. you? Did that cure your um your my arm, my shattered arm? Oh yeah, yeah. No, it it it, it cleared my ear chlamydia. Um, yeah, cleared it right and out. All my hair grew back too. All your, I'm yeah, no longer yeah. bald. Uh huh. Yeah, you even you even have several other people's hair. Um, yeah, just from yeah. listening to the fucking ad. That's how yeah. powerful that is. So yeah. I'm definitely yeah. gonna buy it. Yeah, absolutely, folks. Spend your money, please. 
So from the end of the 90s to the early 2000s, Scone expanded rapidly, driven by the surge in foreign religious tourists who flooded into Nigeria to see the man deemed a prophet and miracle worker. According to former associates, he often paid for the plane tickets of these white evangelicals because he saw their presence as the best marketing his church would get. Every youth group leader or pastor from the U.S. or Europe who visited came back enthralled and directed funds and more followers T.B. Joshua's way. White followers again also acted as marketing for his church within Nigeria. It was important to him that the synagogue church of all nations be seen as a world church, and this made it more appealing to Nigerians for the same reason people are always drawn to international celebrities, right? Are you more impressed with like the guy who like, he's got like a local access TV show and he owns a car lot, or are you more impressed by like the NFL dude who owns a a series of car dealerships, right? I don't care like, about the NFL, dude. But I mean, if you're like a, if you're some dude named TB Joshua, dude, and you got some yeah. South Africans doing yeah. footloose shit, doing, mm-hmm. yeah, you got them dancing. You got South Africans dancing. You got them doing footloose. <laughs> well, hey, now you got my attention. I might get to meet John Lithgow, and I've always wanted to meet John <laughs> Lithgow. <laughs> uh, that would totally change my opinion of this guy. If there's if John, John Lithgow, Lithgow in there? the mix, yeah, I'll oh, do yeah. anything to meet John Lithgow. Oh yeah, um, I mean he's in the best season of Dexter. He's in the best season of Dexter. He's in Buckaroo Banzai. What? What? <laughs> Let's what just go can't down the he list. do? Yeah, yeah. Da- just a just a, a rich, rich history of being John Lithgow. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, uh, it was all brilliantly executed. Footage from the church in this period is distinctly uncomfortable. You can see very small groups of ravenously excited white evangelicals given positions of honor at the front of huge stadium crowds of Nigerian citizens. Like look at look at this picture here. Like it's yeah. it's very stark. Like Oof. all the white people in one area, everyone else in another, and the white people are right next to TB Joshua. Yeah, it's sort of like kind of like the same logic of like the uh, like a MAGA rally where it's like, yeah. please help the people like the few people of color. Please give them prominent spaces, even though it's the same five people. Just please. We need them there. We need them there. Yeah. So TV preaching was and is huge in Nigeria, but TV Joshua took it to another level, filming much more than most of his colleagues and theming his videos for an international audience. One interview he recorded features a white English woman asking him why he makes so many videos, and his answer is fucking amazing. Because if Jesus was not recorded in the Bible, you would not believe that. Jesus is the same today. I fucking love that answer. I fucking love that that answer. That is like that. That's a smart man. That's yeah. a smart man. Like, he either had that in the chamber or he just extempt that shit. But that yeah. is good. <laughs> Oof, what a fucking clap back. Yeah, that man knows his business. I'll give yeah. him that. It's a horrible <laughs> business, but he fucking knows it. Fucking knows it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's fun stuff. So... I want to play a clip for you here of a woman you're about to hear from this lady is the church's head of foreign visitor relations. And she's talking about kind of bringing in these like foreign white religious tourists to scone. Um, uh, So we're going to press play here. For TB Joshua, it was a game and a trap that he sets for the white people. Yeah, (laughs) that's... That's fun. <laughs> yeah, there's no ambiguity around no, that. Yeah, no ambiguity the there. He said um, for the white people. Okay, and, TB. We're going to continue in a second, but there's a couple of things going on here. One is that for these young people traveling from other parts of the world, these are mostly kids who are more affluent. Uh, they are seeing the wider world for the first time, and that's yeah. intoxicating. Anytime you go to a country that's not like the suburbs, right? Yeah. And you're so sheltered, too, and yeah, probably ex- in such a homogenous fucking yeah. environment. Yeah. Yeah, it's a drug. And in addition to just like, yeah, you're in Africa after a lifetime in a place that is not at all Africa, and that's like this whole fascinating journey. And then you get love bombed, too. You are the focus yeah. of, of thousands of locals who are not – it's not just like going to a country and being like a tourist. It's going to a country and seeing a crowd of locals overjoyed that you're there. Yeah. Um, and then after you get love bombed, over the next several days, these tourists – the first like couple of days you spend at Scone, you're just watching hours of miracle videos every day. It's like a clockwork orange style thing. Skin and then the after your treatment. Yeah. And you prime them with the videos and then you do live miracle shows, right? Because you don't want them to just see that shit when they're like kind of tired and exhausted. Like you want them in the most suggestible mind state possible. Right, right, right. You prime that shit. Yeah. Horny for a miracle. Horny absolutely. for a miracle. Get him absolutely horny for a miracle. Yeah. And it's wild that he's using the same playbook as like Andrew Tate and all these other people. It's like yeah. traffic them in. Yeah. 
love bomb them, and then and then run run your playbook. There's, cult leaders only ever work what like there's variations based on the tech available to you yeah, in the time exactly. period, but it's all the same. You know, VHS, DVD, streaming, mm-hmm, whatever, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. or it's the way L. Ron Hubbard did thing. it. You know, yeah, you know, the classic way with boats. Uh, we're gonna play you one more clip uh, explaining how this process goes. I'd never seen a local African town before, and it was hustle and bustle, and uh, street sellers and food, and it was very colourful. I was just taking everything in. So you kind of went down a driveway um, in these um, these vehicles that had other foreign visitors in. There were tour groups going up from South Africa in quite large numbers. I'm Angelique, and I'm from South Africa. Even before I went, I had these VHS tapes that I'd watched and I'd seen the most incredible things. And I was so beyond excited to, to, to see this in real life. I was coordinator of international visitors. Anytime this visitor come, T.B. Joshua will call and say, go and meet your visitors. Nigerian disciples with these beautiful smiles welcome you. There's just people smiling. Everyone looks so happy. We make you feel like, like celebrity. Oh man. Yeah, uh, that's that's Jesus. it's it's so smart. Like it yeah. is such a it's such a slick operation. I'm just very I'm as as evil as all of this is. I'm very impressed. Right. This is the point at which the bastardry hits full swing because. One of the chief things he'll do when he's like showing people life miracles is he'll cure HIV, right? And the way you the way you do this Fuck. is you have someone come up with like a piece of paper that looks official that says I have HIV, and then you pray over them, and then they get a test, and they come back with a sheet of paper that says I don't have HIV, right? You Simple. you know I don't have to explain to you how to fake that, right? It's not hard. Like yeah. you have a printer, you can yeah. bribe a doctor, right? But it's very impressive to these kids. And I, I'm gonna have Sophie play you one more clip here. When I came here. I had been suffering from asthma, and after a short time of ministry oh, from the prophet T.B. Joshua, I felt my breathing come totally clear. God had healed me. Sir, I see you've got a medical report here. Can you please just show the camera that? Praise be to God, negative tested for HIV and HIV too. So it's not that fucked up to just like it's fucked up, but like the the amount of damage you can do by convincing like these these evangelical tourists that mm-hmm. you've cured someone's AIDS, you're mainly just going to be able to abuse them more, right? Right. But it you're not necessarily causing a public health crisis with that. What does cause the public health crisis is that he is also convincing his Nigerian followers of this, right? Ooh. And they are actually the people who have HIV at a heightened right. rate, right? Certainly higher than these like evangelical tourists. And not only is he convincing them that he can cure them by praying over them, Part of what he's convincing them is that they should not go get medical treatment or take retrovirals for their HIV. Oh my God. Right? HIV retrovirals are very available. HIV is very treatable. It is not a death sentence when you have access to retrovirals. And one of the things he is doing to members of his flock is telling them, do not take these. God doesn't want you to take these. I can cure your HIV. And We don't know how many people he got to stop taking their retrovirals as a result of this, but we do know that in 2011, in one publicized case, three women in London died when they were convinced by preachers to stop taking their retrovirals, and one of those preachers was T.B. Joshua, and I think these these women were immigrants. Um, When reporters asked T.B. Joshua if he uh, advised followers to avoid treating their HIV, he gave this answer. Let me tell you, I am a medium. In the same way, doctors are mediums to bring treatment. So he's basically saying, hey, I'm just a doctor too, you know? Yeah. One follower I read an interview with, because he's not just doing this with HIV, he's telling people to avoid all sorts of modern medicine in favor right. of paying him, you know, to pray over them. Um, one of his followers, a devoted member of the church who was like helping to run the church, um, his mother was enthralled with TB Joshua and refused to take chemotherapy for her cancer after Joshua healed her and told her that she did not need it. Within six months, she was dead. 
This follower, who again was a dedicated volunteer of the church, calls TB Joshua. He's close enough to this guy to have his phone number. He calls him to let him know that his mom is dead. And TB Joshua hangs up on him. And he later, he like asks one of the other workers there, like, he hung up on me. Like, what the fuck? And that guy's like, well, the prophet doesn't listen to bad news. Uh oh. <laughs> Hey, you're going to fuck up the prophet's Cold. confirmation bias. So don't fucking tell him about that shit. Mm -hmm. He's just going to, oh yeah, you're just going to yeah. hear the click. It's wild wow. stuff. Anyway, wow. that's the TB Joshua story. Oh. You got anything to plug at the end of part one, Miles? Please, you know, uh, when, when appropriate, listen to uh, your healthcare providers uh, and not someone named uh, TB Joshua or whatever. Yeah. TD uh, Jakes, I don't care who it is. AT&T. Don't, don't get don't get health advice for many of them. Yeah, uh plug uh yeah, just listen to uh the Daily Zeitgeist. Uh yeah. you know, that's my daily news and politics and comedy shit show and mm -hmm. uh if you like 90 Day Fiance, look, one of your other favorite guests, Sophia yeah. Alexandra, that's a show I host with her. And yeah. that's just us getting high and talking about 90 Day Fiance. That's how we kind of blow steam off after, between bastards recordings and you know just the general yeah. world of it all uh well uh blow off some steam with that and yeah. uh, blow off some steam with steam i don't know yeah and sure. we and we at cool zone media have a new show the theraflu is really starting to My, fuck me up now uh, huh? we, we, yeah. we, we, we plug ed show <laughs> oh yeah ed's got a show it's called better offline it's about all the fucked up tech industry shit that you probably need to know because they're actively trying to destroy your life and everyone else's life. So, you know, keep an eye out for that. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to go miles. I'm going to go. Uh, I'm going to go hang out at a fucking playground with a, with a, a spoon and some foil and a packet of Theraflu. Yeah. And, watch. Uh, you're going to go to yeah. like a needle exchange and they're like, yeah. no man, this is for people that actually need it, man. <laughs> That's your fucking weirdo Theraflu shit. Dude. Yeah. You're, yeah. You should be ashamed of yourself. <laughs> going to take a needle from one of my diabetic friends to shoot Theraflu up. <laughs> you're like my EpiPen. Where is it? Oh, sorry. I needed the needle. Yeah. No, for my I empty, I emptied the uh, epinephrine from my EpiPen and just theraflued yeah. that shit up just get that right into the meat <laughs> Jesus Christ the episode is so over bye Behind the Bastards is a production of Cool Zone Media for more from Cool Zone Media visit our website coolzonemedia.com or check us out on the iHeartRadio app Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts